maximum freedom. Read. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Actual Anarchy Podcast, podcast where we talk about movies from a Rothbardian and narco capitalist perspective. Tonight we're going to be doing uh, Nazis versus commies. And uh, I got to be honest, it's a little bit hard to choose between the two, the two great evils of the uh, 20th century, apparently, if, you, if we're paying attention to uh, our history professors, right, Robert? My co host extraordinaire hey what's up everybody yeah, yeah this movie features the heroic uh communists versus the evil nazis i don't know if i've ever seen a nazi portrayed in a negative light before but yeah this movie does it bold well, steps well we'll get into this a little bit i, I think that the, the commies are, are kind of shat upon as well pretty pretty heartily in this one but uh yeah yeah I'll make my arguments. I'll make my arguments. This okay, is, you uh, got arguments? Good. Yeah, I got a couple. And uh, this is episode 163 of the show. You can find the show notes more at actualanarchy.com slash 163. And as we've been uh, doing recently, Robert, I want to just check in with you. How is the weather impacting your entrepreneurial efforts? I know that we're about to get hit with a bunch of snowstorms. Does that impact you guys? Are you not able to open? Uh, does it diminish your traffic? What, what's your strategy going forward here? It can affect, definitely can affect business. It could also affect it for the, in a positive way. Uh, if it's, if it's snowing at the time, then that definitely hurts us. But a little snow on the ground can also kind of, you know, it prevents people from doing other things or wanting to cook. So they'll come over and get us. But um, the main problem is that with our current setup, we rent these facilities that were made in like the 1940s. They were the original granges were actually made by the Grangers. And that's where they got their name. And they were one of the first like original schoolhouses in the country and because they realized, you know, that people need an education. So before the state got involved, it was handled privately, which is interesting. But these buildings, as you can imagine, weren't built with modern day hood fans and they're not huge money makers either. So it's rare when you would actually find one with any kind of renovation done, say, post 1980. So we have to actually cook a lot of our food outside. And when it's negative degrees or it's even, you know, with wind chill, it can get down into the zeros. And that's just bad news bears when you're trying to do any kind of cooking, especially with like oil, you're trying to heat up oil. It just won't heat up. So we actually had to cook inside yesterday illegally because we didn't have the proper ventilation. And we ended up actually setting off the uh, fire alarm a few times, which didn't seem to bother anybody, which is fine. I mean, it, it shouldn't have, it wasn't like too bad or anything. It wasn't like <laughs> this fires. Is fine. It was just <laughs> <laughs> the market uh finds a way robert so That's yeah right. you guys are doing great great work there i, I recall going to um your... oh by the way by the way daniel since yeah you applied to my open position i want you to know <laughs> that since you were a no call no show on your interview you are hereby shit canned and fired get the fuck out of here i'm never going to consider you for any position ever again all right, all right. So there's a little story behind this. Robert runs most of his uh, marketing stuff through Facebook, and and he posted a a job, uh, job on on Facebook, and I applied. I put in some half-assed answers, and then I missed the appointment. So yeah, so I, I saw your application, and I go, "This guy looks like a promising individual. He looks a little old <laughs> for my tastes." But he could probably still physically do the job. I mean, maybe if he's arthritis isn't kicking in too badly. And so I set up this interview and no call, no show. I mean, what kind of who does that? Terrible. Yeah. I mean, the only other people that do that 
are these Tommies. people that want their unemployment benefits and they want to be able to show to the state that busted <laughs> yeah they want to show to the state that hey i'm looking for work so here i am applying for all these jobs oh i didn't get it so that's what i think happened in this situation um he's probably just applying as a joke to uh, collect unemployment for you know another week or two or whatever he's trying to scam he's trying to run all that right, sounds I'll entirely plausible it does sound plausible and, and and because of that there's an air of like validity to it but i will counter and say that i i applied for this job as a farce but also i i recall hearing about how many hours you work and how you're exploited by your employer and how awful mm. the working conditions are and mm. so i Terrible. after hearing about that i ghosted your ass <laughs> and <laughs> didn't bother <laughs> even texting with you know that i'm not going to show up so yeah now you got to pay me severance and uh, all the rest of it. Otherwise, I'll sue your ass. I'll see you in court, you <laughs> son of a bitch. Wasting my time. All right, let's see our way to the last nerds for the show. And we actually introduce our guests and talk about this movie or something. Okay. All right. Ooh. Hey everyone, it's Daniel Elwood and Robert Johnson, and we are the Last Nighters, and the Last Nighters can be found on the Launchpad Media, where they're always launching new ideas in your direction. Check it out at thelaunchpadmedia.com. This is episode 106 of the show. You can find the show notes at lastnighters.com slash 106. We're going to be talking about Enemy, of the, Enemy at the Gates with a uh, multi-time returning guest. And I just want to throw out there that uh, the last episode we did uh, on The Village, we were starting a new trend of only having women on the show. Uh, we have now... In a magician's trick, cut the representation of women in half. Uh, and we will now have our buddy Scott M., also known as Crazy Heart, join us for this episode. Uh, Scott, how are you? Thank you for joining us. You were here for uh, Crazy Heart and Joker. Uh, so this is your third time back to the show for Enemy at the Gates. Uh, how yeah. you doing? I'm doing well. Doing excellent. Ready to talk about this. I just read... I actually went back and reread some of my book to see if I could match up what they were doing in the story. So maybe we'll have some more to talk about. Yeah, that that would be good. I I, I did read or did. It's it's weird to say that I read about a movie that's based on a book because I didn't read the book like you did. But uh, perhaps you will have additional insight into the background behind this thing. It did seem like there was a fair amount of um, creative license in in what I read about it in the you know production of of the film um but it's basically a propaganda film about propaganda so what, what are you going to do you know but uh scott thanks again for for joining us and we will have a link to all of your stuff that you've been on previously and uh, we always have a good time with you uh, hey, hey let me grab this book all right well while he's doing that i will uh, kick into the google description we'll go to robert for his reaction maybe after all this noise subsides <laughs> all right uh the good description ah, there it is all right ridiculous uh enemy at the gates came out in 2001 it's a drama slash thriller two hours and 11 minutes 7.6 imdb uh 54 percent raw tomatoes and 4.3 out of 5 on voodoo with 92 percent of google users liking it Vasily, played by Jude Law, is a young Russian sharpshooter who becomes a legend when a savvy political officer, played by Joseph Fiennes, makes him a hero with his propaganda campaign. Their friendship is threatened when both men fall in love with a beautiful female soldier, played by Rachel Weiss. As the battle for the city rages, Vasily faces the ultimate challenge when the Nazi command disp dispatches its most elite marksman, uh, Ed Harris, to hunt down and kill the man who has become the hope of all of Russia. Came out March 16, 2001, and uh, the director is Jean-Jacques Arnaud, and it had a $70 million budget. It uh, won a couple of awards. It seemed to be uh, doing uh, fairly well. Um, Robert, what is your take on the description and uh, anything you want to open with? Well, it's a decent enough hero's journey kind of a movie. It's historically 
not at all accurate. I would have to say, I, I, I obviously haven't read the book. Well, I'm looking to forward to get crazy hearts opinion on that. But from what I understand, and I am a bit of a world war two buff just because, you know, that's just sort of the thing you do when you're a man in your like thirties and forties, as you see kind of get into like war history and stuff. I don't know why, but it's just kind of a thing. And, um, you know, it, it tells a decent enough story. I'll say that it, it starts off with this hero's journey where he's just this young unknown guy, whether or not that's accurate to real life, we can get into that, but you know, he's thrown into this battle. He has no chance of surviving, but he ends up surviving and doing really, really well. And then he runs into this guy by pure happenstance who recognizes his value as a propaganda tool. And then his career is launched and then he becomes this kind of political pawn slash propaganda hero, you know, symbol of the resistance, symbol of the Russian people against the uh, invading German army. And then they also throw in a, the, the duel with the Ed Harris character and the romance with the Rachel Weiss character. And it all kind of comes together sort of kind of an, is an anti-communist kind of a statement film in a way, but I don't know. It's kind of muddled, you know, I mean, it, it's almost like what, what kind of a movie are you trying to tell? I don't know. It, it, I didn't walk away with it with super high opinion of it, but you know, it's, it's definitely an interesting film to discuss and I'm looking forward to our uh, talk here. All right. Well, that's very good. And I, I tend to agree with you that it, it did feel a little bit muddled, muddled together. And I, it was hard to really know why certain things were happening or why they were part of the story. And the romance, I didn't buy at all. It just seemed like they wanted to make it to be a romantic film for whatever reason, when it could have just stuck to the, the war and the duel with the Ed Harris character. And I think that that probably would have been sufficient and, and compelling enough rather than having this kind of distraction almost with. Uh, yeah, I think it is. I, I, I think you're right about that, but I think it's also interesting that it's not even confirmed whether or not this duel even happened. That like a lot of people think that this was completely contrived duel, like as a propaganda thing after the fact to boost up him, you know, in the eyes of the people and whatnot to build up his reputation and status. That's kind of interesting yeah. that this whole thing might not have even happened. I don't know if the book goes in. I mean, uh, Vasily Saitsev is a super, super famous real life guy who had a long and distinguished career of killing people mm -hmm. throughout the war. So that's certainly true. And he did fight in the, in the, in the battle of Stalingrad, but whether or not he had a duel with some major German guy, I, I don't know if that's true at all. Right. Yeah, and Ed, Ed Harris was pretty menacing in this, I think. He's got that steely-eyed look all the time. You know? <laughs> oh, man, like, he really looked like a German officer, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he had, definitely had wolf wolf vibes, you know? Like, he was the hunter, and he was, like, mm -hmm. the old sage-like, you know, you don't fuck with this guy. He's pretty pretty, uh, pretty uh, good. Um, but uh, before we go to Scott, I just wanted to bring up the, um, you know, in the movie, it's depicted that they change tactics to motivate the people compared to what they were doing prior. And this was, um, what's his name? Danilov's, uh, Joseph Fine's like idea is to try a different tactic than just shooting people, shooting deserters, shooting retreaters. Like it, it, it seems as if they were shooting more of their own people than even the Germans were, at least at the start of this film. And, and that was their way of motivating the people. Well, if you don't go and fight, we're going to shoot you. And Danilov came up with, well, what if we inspire them? What if we go Obama style and give them hope, hope and change that they can believe in? And that's why they could build up Vasily into this hero character, somebody to revere and look up to and become a symbol. And it, it very much is propaganda, but it's to lift the morale, lift the spirits of these people who are otherwise, you know, just being shat upon by even their own uh, military or their own officers. Right. And you bring up probably the most unrealistic, I mean, outside of maybe the love story, 
the, the most unrealistic thing happening in the film is that you've got Nikita Khrushchev down here in the, in the tunnels and they're having this meeting and what do you say? What is his name? Danilov like explains the value of propaganda to him. Like, Hey, I got this idea. We could have this thing called like state propaganda and it could like, we could use it to our benefit the idea that he invented it and that <laughs> Khrushchev was like, Oh yeah, that sounds like a really good idea. There's been <laughs> this those genius governments have been using propaganda, <laughs> especially the communists since before they were began, they were constantly trying to remodel the, the average Soviet citizen into the new socialist man and all of being all about the fatherland and, you know, uh, producing for other people and all this crap. You can look at any kind of Google search and find all this great Soviet propaganda art that uh, <laughs> was meant to reshape and remodel the human mind. So the, the idea that Danilov invented it in the trenches of Stalingrad in 1942, it's, it's just kind of funny. Yeah. It's not like he's Edward Bernays, right? Right. But All the right. other thing, the other thing, the um, the massacring of the soldiers, their own soldiers, that is based on a real thing. But it's not. I mean, the, the idea that they were just going to gun down entire squads of troops is a little bit ridiculous. Um, there was an order 227 by Stalin, which was a no retreat order. It's a. Uh, I think it's funny that it's named 227. And then there was a, a, a show in the 80s called 227, which is about these sassy black women. Moving on up. Be, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, if there were like sassy black women like chasing down and hunting down Soviet citizens that didn't want to fight in the Red Army anymore. But um, yeah, they actually did hunt down people that, you know, wanted to desert and whatever. And they ended up, I think the official numbers or at least estimates are around 10,000 people that they shot and killed. Um, but they didn't just massively mow down yeah. people. They were usually arrested and that sort of thing, but it's still a horrific thing. And I think it works sort of well in the film just to give the idea that, Hey, he's in this hopelessly desperate situation where he has no choice, but to, you can't retreat and you can't really move forward. So he has to play dead and then, you know, he's what happens happens. So it's okay narratively in that respect, but it's not very accurate to real life. All right. Well, that, that's a good segue into, into Scott, cause you've read the book and, and recently seen the film. Um, what's your take on the level of accuracy and how much they've embellished and then, yeah, take, take this where you want to go. Not, not the enemy of the gates book. This is just, first-hand account it's just they i guess the the russians finally opened up a whole stockpile of letters um that were sent out and captured uh, inside and no this one says um the legend tells how a german major the head of a sniper school in berlin was sent from germany especially to kill him the tale was given credence by general chukov and his memoir of the battle but to this day, it is not clear how much truth there is in it. There are no German records of any such sniper being dispatched from Berlin. His name is usually given as Major Konings or Konig, and sometimes as Heinz Thornwald or Thorwald. And the idea may have been cooked up by the Russian propaganda machine. Certainly, there are telltale signs that the story of their duel in the ruins of the city is Soviet invention. The simple struggle between good and evil seems designed to appeal to an unsophisticated Soviet public. Moreover, the major of the story is an intellectual bourgeoisie academic in a way, so there are overtones of the classic Marcus struggle, conflict, whatever. And there is a deeper David versus Goliath myth. Um, the honest shepherd boy takes on the champion of the mighty enemy. What seems clear is that Zatsev himself was told that a German hitman had been sent with the specific task of assassinating him, that he believed it, and that he was convinced that he killed the man. Uh, and then that Zatsev was later wounded in the eyes, which put an end to his sniping career, but he continued to teach his skill 
at some sniper school. So yeah, huh? it's they don't know if he if the general was actually sent, but the guy seems to believe that somebody was out to kill him and that he got him. All right. Well, if we just take the movie at face value, there's certainly pop propaganda in making Vasily become this hero. That's what oh, Daniel yeah. kind of comes up with to help motivate the, the mm-hmm. Russian people and the other Russian soldiers. But it's also interesting because from, from this additional uh, information you provided, it seems like there's even additional propaganda, more propaganda to make it this David versus Goliath story, to make it have this, um, this very strong, powerful evil that the good hearted, you know, Vasily is fighting against. Right. So it, it gives it a little bit more weight even on the other end of it. Yeah. And uh, sniper duels certainly are a real thing. Oh yeah. They've happened ever since there have been snipers. So I mean I, I think I've watched one history channel thing where it was talking about some US sniper in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And he was describing yeah. some epic sniper duel against the Viet Cong guy. Mm-hmm. They kept so, going I mean, back and forth in circles. Yeah, that's right. And then they'd be in each other's positions and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, you saw the same thing. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Oh, I forget his name, but he did. He also had the legend of where he like belly crawled for like four days through the open field of like a whole bunch of patrolling Vietnamese to shoot a general and then managed to belly crawl his way back out. Like yeah, snipers shot. are fascinating soldiers if you're if you're into that sort of thing. They they do take some serious risks for, for what they do. Yeah, the the crazy this this kind of because there was another guy too, um, the guy that kind of started it that maybe even we got Zietsky off of was some uh, Anatoly Chekhov. That was the most celebrated sniper. Um, but it started Is that a the Norwegian guy. Uh, maybe I don't think the book says that. Um, no, it doesn't say where he's from. But they, uh, it started, of course, this cult. And there's a story in here of how um, several top flight snipers are actually killed because what would happen is they would find themselves a little nest and they'd shoot from it and then they'd leave. And some young kid that wants to be a sniper would go into these holes and shoot from it also. And then this would reveal the position. So when the sniper comes back, chop the mortar around or hit it with an artillery shell and kill them. Mm. Yeah. It's crazy stuff, but I don't know. The book seems to imply that it wasn't anything real, but they do. They did a pretty good job of, of kind of demonstrating how different the two people were, you know, he's sitting in the train car and looks over at the wounded guys and lowers down the shade. Like, you can't look in my window. I'm, I'm above you. I don't need to see such terrible wounds. And then the other guy's almost sympathetic when he gets off the boat to seeing all the wounded people. Yeah, you're comparing um, Ed Harris to the Jude Law character. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when Jude off. Law gets off the boat. Yeah. They the, in the beginning of the movie they said September 20th, and so I went and found in the book that I've got everything on September 20th and what was happening. And so the only thing that, and I wish I had followed it up, but I guess I, I, I didn't really think to do that. Um, the 13th guards division was sent in on like the 15th of September. And that's considered to be like saving Stalingrad from the knife's edge. Like, who was it that was holding out? Um, I don't. I don't know. I didn't read that one, but they were right there, about to get overrun. Thirteenth Division gets shipped across, which they did a pretty good job there at the beginning on the Volga, um, showing how much of a massacre it was because that did happen. There were they sent over like ten thousand guys, um, and it was just broad daylight, like bring it on, and so they're watching dudes drown because you can't stop. Uh, so the boats would get hit, and you're just hoping they don't shoot you. I can't imagine that. You can't do anything. You didn't get a weapon because your country's socialist and doesn't have, isn't capable of providing you firearms. 
Right, yeah. The one with the rifle shoots, the one without follows him. When yeah. the one with the rifle yeah. is killed, the one who follows picks up the rifle and shoots. Yeah. I, just, I can't imagine that. Just running into the heat of battle, especially seeing that on the other side, because the Volga, man, the first few days after Stalingrad was hit, and that's pretty close uh, still to the beginning of it. Um, it would have been cool if they had showed this part, but when they first bombed the city, they'd hit all the oil tanks and it just spilled oil all the way across the Volga. And so the whole freaking river was just on fire. And it would have been neat if they had shown that. I can't imagine what that would have been like to see. Indeed. Yeah. Well, right. the movie, what do you guys think of the claim that the movie makes it right at the beginning where it says that the fate of the world is at stake. Mm -hmm. That if Hitler takes Stalingrad, he goes on to basically rule the world. I, I think that's some, some crazy hyperbole. It sets the stakes for the film, sure. And it, you know, makes the, you get behind the, the heroes of the film to, you know, fight against the evil Nazis. But there's so many you know, it plays into this trope that, you know, if you if you value your freedom, you know, think think of that because, you know, otherwise we'd all be speaking German because Hitler was going to just go on and attack the United States or he's going to do this or that and just conquer the whole world. And I, it, it all sounds like a massive pipe dream. Uh, maybe, you know, 20 or 30 late years later, if he had actually consolidated Russia and consolidated Europe and was allowed to rebuild back up and use all the resources of those places and then went on another murderous rampage. Maybe we could have another discussion, but the idea yeah, that he was in, style. Yeah, right. Right. Exactly. But, but even if, you know, at the height of Hitler's powers, he was no threat to the United States. He was barely a threat to anybody outside of Europe. So to say that he was, you know, going to conquer the whole world was, was far fetched at best. I do like that, you know, it sets the, stakes for the film but it's like eh, really okay i guess yeah well, now robert I know, I know you've looked into this um probably more than me but didn't russia sustain the most number of casualties and certainly 20 million of anybody yeah. any any nation in the mm -hmm. in the world war ii i asked that at trivia nights all right yeah and I guess if if we see what's depicted in the film, if it's even anything like that, like you've got this sort of backwards country that's agrarian in many ways, where they can't even arm the people to defend against this German onslaught that's, um, you know, doing like a blitzkrieg across uh, Ukraine in, into Russia. Uh, wasn't it just, wasn't what turned Hitler back the winter? Didn't they freeze them Certainly. out? The siege of Stalingrad. They, they basically held it to a stalemate, and then the, yeah, the winter mm -hmm. allowed them to surround the German army. At which point they starved them out, and Ger Germany airdropped in supplies for quite some time. They were dumping all kinds of supplies in, but eventually the Luftwaffe couldn't sustain that, and yeah, they uh, they were wholesale captured and slaughtered. So mm -hmm. it was mostly they were held back and they, they invaded, they invaded Russia just like Napoleon did with mm -hmm. these lofty ideas that they were just going to go in and stomp these, you know, hicks in these backward, like Marching agrarian us, hicks yeah. and farmers and whatnots with all our advanced technology. And yeah, they were, if they ever actually get to them and fight them, but they, Russia's a huge place. I mean, just enormous. And the Russians, they destroyed a lot of their railways as they were retreating. So all the, you know, the, the weather, you're trying to drive these trucks over through the mud. It's, it bogged them down and they ran out of gas a lot of times. They were basically in a war of attrition and it became a supply battle. And yeah, the winter really did turn them away. And a lot of uh, Nazi soldiers basically froze to death. I mean, they were suffering from horrific frostbite and gangrene and that sort of thing and starvation. So right, and yeah. I don't take any, any credit that's away the, from that's home field advantage, by the way, that's just home field advantage. Right, right. And, right. 
of course, people defending their, you know, their family and their communities are, you know, obviously more righteously, you know, legitimately defending themselves than these aggressors. So I don't want to diminish what, what they did, but, you know, the weather certainly played a big role in it. And also, as you were saying, the, um, scorched earth policy of as they're retreating, destroying all the supplies so that the enemy can't advance as easily or, or restock or those things. Uh, I mean, that's just good strategy as far as inhibiting and slowing down an advancing army that's bearing down on you. Well, in, in Soviet Russia, they were, you know, like Stalin had his like five-year plan to industrialize and whatnot. They were in the process of industrializing and mechanizing and not at the beginning of the war. Yeah. They were in this really sorry shape, but you know, a communist state is in, inefficient as it is, can still kind of like aim all this industrial power, you know, towards the war effort. And they started just pumping out these T32 and 34 tanks, just pumping them out. And they just made thousands and thousands of these things. And uh, yeah, as the tide turned, they were just started steamrolling with uh, an actually a decent modern army towards the end of the war. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to tie this back to the movie just uh, a little bit here. When we get introduced to Khrushchev, he's berating the general who is barely holding on to Stalingrad and, and like being upset with him for not being able to motivate his men to like go get slaughtered faster, I guess. And so he says to him, perhaps you'd like to avoid the red tape and then slides a pistol across to him mm -hmm. uh, so that he can kill himself, unlike Jeffrey Epstein. And I was <laughs> wondering uh, if, if you guys like kind of caught that, like it's, it's uh, not so subtle, like, all right, well, I'm either going to shoot you or you're going to have to shoot yourself. And that's in that same line of thinking of, you know, the, the motivating of, the others around there, those propaganda officers, like they heard that gunshot. They knew because that guy had failed in his mission that that was the consequence. And so that would have been their consequence if they failed in their mission as well. Yeah, it's definitely a, a motivating yeah. force. Um, it's, I think a lot of generals throughout time have fallen on their sword I don't know, either symbolically as they've lost or maybe served as an example. Just the shame. I, I think of, you know, Bushido Japan, where they're always disemboweling themselves mm -hmm. out of shame. But I could see uh, what, to your point, that it served as a decent motivational thing. Although at a certain point, and, and I think this, the Soviet Union suffered from this a great deal, massively, was brain drain. Because during the purge and other other times, Stalin basically killed everybody with an IQ over, you know, a hundred. And so, you know, anybody that was a potential threat to him, well, you start killing all your generals and who's left. I mean, Hitler, I uh, demoted a lot of generals and that sort of thing too. But, you know, so eventually you're left with people with no experience, no idea what they're doing. I mean, you can also promote people too that show you know, promise, but for, you know, even when you kill a man because he's failed once, it's like it, you're not giving him a chance to learn from his mistakes. It's, it's, I think it's bad play. Stupid. I mean, they ended up winning, but that's just because Hitler overextended himself for the most part. Yeah. And, and they had the 20 million guys uh, willing to get shot, I guess. Not so much willing, but yeah, forced. <laughs> well, somewhat willing. Pushed into getting shot. Uh, and I think, didn't they make reference to it? I forget which side it was, but he was saying how they had lost so many officers that they were promoting like 27 sergeants to become officers. Was that the... At that, that time. Yeah, that's the beginning. That's the beginning of Stalingrad. That was... And they were, they that were was, fighting the hill. That was that was the German guy talking when he was right. talking oh, about how oh, Seitzev yeah. was well, killing all oh, their officers. Well, no, even then, because uh, I, I, I think they were trying to depict... Paulus. I think that was trying to depict General Paulus, like the head guy of the Sixth Army, um, to like give another layer of how sophisticated this general was that he got to meet the head guy over the Sixth Army invading Stalingrad. Um, but 
Yeah, no, at that time, I mean, because it was, I was beginning, and they were, they were just dumping men. They were trying to capture this hill, um, and the top of it meant you could see everything all the way to the Volga. And they just slaughtered men. They are just throwing people at it. Um, and so it would make sense that they were losing that. I don't know if it was that, I don't know the numbers, but at that early in the stage of Stalingrad, there were certainly hell on earth there. A lot of people were getting killed. All right, can I take us to a, a thing that I thought was kind of ridiculous, but apparently it must be an actual thing. The dog tags and getting the evidence for who you've shot because the sniper Vasily would go after officers and then have to go and retrieve these tags and it ended up getting him into a, like a trap, right? It ended up getting two of his people killed because it was known that they were always looking for these dog tags to prove who was to be killed. And then um, additional to that, when... Uh, the German guy Koenig or, or whatever his name was, the Ed Harris character, when he goes into battle against Vasily, he takes his dog tags off because the German general is like, we don't want if you get killed for this to be a huge morale booster for them to find your dog tags and to find that you were the one who was killed. Right. Yeah, I, I seem to be a, a realistic thing. If you if you had some character that was super valuable to your war effort or your propaganda value, you wouldn't want the enemy to be able to parade him through your streets, demoralize you know your your support. Right, and and we saw this even when they found Vasily's like journal, and they're like, "Oh, Vasily is dead." Then, even that, they said, "Well, that's a lie," right? So they can twist anything. Like, say you did find the guy's dog tags. You just say, well, that's that's fake, fake information, fake news. Yeah. I mean, it's all, uh, all around. Information is so fluid and murky that, yeah, everybody's lying all the time. How do you know what's true anyway or what to believe? That's that's government Especially for you. In the middle of that. Yeah, goodness. Right in the yeah, media things. It just you know, seemed like. Did- a ridiculous thing to, to have to go and retrieve these dog tags to me. Like the risk versus the reward. I mean, you're in the middle of this freaking well, war they, zone. They might also have they might also have information on them. I mean you might you Possibly. might have to go just to just to get try and get information. Um but no, you know, the other thing, and it kind of goes with well, it does go with what you're the not one step back thing because they showed the couple uh, people that were kissing the two Russian comrades um, that end up getting killed, um, and that shit happened all the time. And I think I think the the reason it wasn't so prevalent that people were just getting shot for retreating was because they were legit in a frenzy to defend Stalingrad. Like they were will they were willing. I mean, I mean, it was every inch. They literally did not. This book is full of just stories of people just laying there until I think they said they wouldn't retreat until the ground was burning beneath them and their coals were smoldering. That was the only time that they would finally step back. Otherwise, they were going to fight out every single inch of that, that ground. But then husbands and wives all the time, they would sign up together. There's stories in here of um, when they finally do attack uh, the Russians and make the big pins or pinch around the city. Um, there was a husband and wife that were a tank crew um, that the Germans, they ended up capturing the wife and killed the husband during the first shot on the tank. And she kept fighting until the tank finally stopped moving and they captured her. And so they were, I wouldn't expect a lot of people to have been slaughtered like they show in the movie. Uh, I think they were legit wanting to run out there and fight and kill the Nazis. There's definitely you're definitely more motivated to defend your own land, yeah. to an invader, for sure, than you mm-hmm. are, say, to be the invader. I mean, what are you fighting for? I mean, the glory of the Reich, I guess, which is some nebulous concept. Mm-hmm. whereas they're actually fighting for blood and soil like 
the person next to them. I mean, that's what the, the Germans end up doing is actually when you are invading some other land, you're like, I don't care about this whatever glory crap. I'm getting a paycheck and I'm fighting for the guy next to me. That's probably how I get through my day. But when you're the defender, yeah, you're fighting for your family, your friends, mm -hmm. your house. And Stalin left the people in the city for a really long time. I mean, they wouldn't let them retreat. I mean, they were there in the city. The city was an active functioning city on the day that the Germans flew in and started bombing. I mean, Stalin did not let them retreat until shit got insanely terrible. So living among the ruins, like with the kid, was commonplace. Having bits of ground where you there was somebody lived there and you captured them and then the Germans captured them and then you captured the ground and people are just living there the whole time you're fighting over this stuff. And the little boy's part was pretty sad. I wouldn't be surprised if stuff like that happened. I mean, not in the way they depict it in the story where they slaughtered them to use them for bait, but there are stories of uh, they would bring out a Russian kid right out into the middle and have him stand there and then they would execute him knowing that everybody, all the Russian guys could see this happening um, and do that and stuff like that. So it was brutal. That's one of those battles that fascinates me. I think that's why I like this movie, but the only thing they really did a really good job of was just depicting how absolutely destroyed everything was. Yeah. And yeah, watch city is looks like Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like after rent control in, in the Bronx or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, this is another film that that really just shows or, or makes you realize just how much of a waste it all is. I mean, just seeing all these people's lives just shattered and destroyed and, and, and all this death and destruction. And for what, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just crazy. Um, but I wanted to uh, bring up another topic related to the movie because we've got the Joseph Fiennes character, Danilov, who is like best buddies with Vasily after Vasily becomes this propaganda piece for him and makes a name for Danilov and gets him noticed by Khrushchev. And he's famous and, and Vasily's famous and things are going really, really well. Um, they have something to you know push out propaganda wise and, and they're getting all this recognition for it. Everything's great until this Rachel Weiss character comes along. And I was like... Dude, bros before hoes, what the hell? Like, <laughs> Vasily's your meal ticket. Why, why are you screwing this guy uh, to go after this woman who you know doesn't really want to give you the time of day? Um, and I guess that's where this sort of felt a little bit forced. You know, this the whole romantic angle, and then of course the the fighting over the girl because I don't know. It, it felt like the Joseph Fiennes character had no shot anyway. So he was just doing this, like he was making a very poor decision. He was thinking with his dick, but not in a way that was actually going to, um, you know, get realized, right? He was trying to do that. Um, what did you call it the other day uh, in the previous episode? The, um, the beta cuck move? The beta male backdoor gambit? Yeah. Friend yeah, zone, yeah. The friend zone backdoor gambit. Yeah. It's where you're, you're in the friend zone and you're just there to support her and then when she's upset about something her boyfriend said you're there to to lay have be a shoulder to cry on and then you <laughs> you sneak your sneak your way in there that way you turn it into a romantic move when she's right. the most vulnerable it's it's generally considered to be a pretty low move and it has low chance of success also by the way right and and for her specifically because he was trying to you know get her away from the front line so that he could have more interaction with her but she was, like you were saying, and, and Scott was saying, she was very intent on defending her neighbors and her friends and her family, her nearby people. And she was in the militia and defending her neighborhood. And so mm -hmm. this, what, what, what uh, Danilo thought he was doing was protecting her, but is actually the exact opposite of what she wanted to be doing. And I think didn't, um, didn't bad shit happen when she was away that she could have, where she felt she could have prevented because she told the story about how her parents got moved off, um, uh, evacuated yeah. the scene, and they were tying people together and to yeah, save and bullets, they would shoot, shoot one mm -hmm. and let the, the dead weight of the other drown the survivor or the, you know, the non-shot victim. God, it's right. terrible. Yeah. 
That's horrifying. I don't know how truthful that is, but shit like that yeah. happened for sure. Well, I know in um, Pol Pot's uh, Cambodia, they, they had a shortage of bullets. And so they would use blunt instruments and, and other means rather than using a valuable resource such as ammunition. Sure. So maybe something similar here. But um, Well, Pol Pot's Cambodia, they got rid of all the smart people and all the people that actually work for a living and, well, worked in any kind of industrial capacity. And or what yeah, left was, yeah, you didn't have a whole lot of people that could make bullets at that point. Right. But what was your take on, on that dynamic between Vasily and Danilov being like mutually beneficial friends, like building this bond. And then just because some girl showed up, just severing I mean, that, just destroying that. It just, it's, it's a kind of a classic movie trope. I don't know if the movie needed the, the love triangle. Um, yeah. Danilov struck me as this, hopelessly you know the nerdy guy that's never going to get the girl and that she just has zero interest in but he since he has you know connections and he can do good things for her family and hmm. that you know that is attractive to a, a, a woman i would imagine and i think has been shown to be in the past and, and currently in the future in the present but it seems uh, like you know reluctantly attractive right like it's not like the ideal situation but it's Hang on one second. I gotta go to the bathroom. All, All right, right, man. Minor break. Let it out. let it go. <laughs> All right. Well, no problem. We'll just take a uh, we'll take a breather here. We got like ten or fifteen minutes left of uh, show time here. Yeah. Do you want to continue our discussion with Adam, or do you want to take a break? Well, uh, why not just continue? Why not? Okay. Okay. So the the friend zone love triangle yeah i i you know a lot of you know love is one thing and i think when people fall in love for a lot of different reasons but a lot of times marriage especially in other parts of the world not necessarily in the western european type you know renaissance tradition of marrying for love a lot of people marry you know in arranged marriages or for resources. And a guy like Danilov is like, Hey, I got all these resources I can, you know, offer. I don't, I don't have the good looks and the, the heroic, whatever, Mr. Nice guy charisma of Jude law, but I got all this other stuff I can offer. But, you know, in this situation, she's like, look, I'm fighting for my life. I'm fighting for all this stuff. I'm not finding you attractive. I'm finding, you know, Jude law attractive and, you know, back off. And, you know, ultimately, Danilov is like, you know, that final scene, he's like, I don't, I don't really understand how he, I mean, he realizes that, which is kind of cool, I thought, you know, that he's like, there is no new man, man will always be man, there will always be somebody rich, rich in certain things, rich in love, rich in charisma, rich in, it's kind of making the anti-equality speech, which is something we've probably made many many times so that was nice to see uh got, really kind of slams communism i don't know if he's going to have this i mean he seems to be a really true believer and to have like this failed love story kind of switch him around it's a little unbelievable but i mean for the story i, I guess it kind of makes sense i didn't really see it coming when it happens i was like oh oh okay Oh wow, he's really throwing communism under the bus there. I like it. Okay, right on. Um, I thought you were Mr. True Blue Propaganda Man, but all right. And then he ends up committing suicide, essentially, um, which leads to, I guess, the killing of the Ed Harris character. I'm not exactly sure how, but anyway, I don't. I, I wasn't really satisfied with that that part of it, where suddenly he's just walking out in the open for no reason. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess he thought he might have killed Saitsev, but uh, why was he just walking out taking a stroll in, in the train yeah. yard? I, that didn't make any sense to me. I did like standing upright. I did. I did like that he took it like a man, though. <clears throat> like when he did realize that that Vasily was right there with his sights on him, he was like, "All right, turns yeah. you got Pants me." Off. Yeah, yeah, that, that was. He went out. He went out of the shield. But it's it was still stupid. 
Yeah. I, yeah, I would have I, I would appreciated it if, you know, it had ended that Vasily learned something new about the major that was like his fatal flaw, like what Crazy Heart was talking about earlier, or you know, revealed his position somehow through some clever new way. Instead, it doesn't end in a sniper duel at all. It just ends in Major was just out walking and could have yeah. been anybody that shot the Major. It just yeah. happened to be Vasily. Right. I mean, there was that scene earlier where Vasily's pinned down, doesn't have his gun, and he doesn't know exactly where uh, Ed Harris is, except all this glass falls down, and then they can see each other in the reflection. <laughs> and then the girl comes to save the day, and he's like, all right, I want you to do this. And then they you know, conveniently don't tell us, the audience, what it is until she actually does it, and it's to shine light at him and stun him or, you know, blind him for a moment. Then he gets shot in the hand. But yeah, that, that would have been a better finale. At least yeah, it was some sort of a sniper duel ish type situation. Mm -hmm. That yeah. would have been nice if that had been the, you, you do something else at that three quarter point in the movie. And then you finish with maybe it's not Rachel Weiss uh, throwing glass at him, but maybe it is Dan Love coming to this realization that yeah he's a piece of shit and communism really doesn't work because as you and i have said many times compensation isn't just monetary it's psychic profit it's things that you prefer there's inequalities in everything uh but if if danilov were to have sacrificed himself like by revealing himself to get shot and that somehow playing into vasily then being able to shoot harris in his position you know like Forcing mm -hmm. Harris's hand into a mistake. Right. I think that would have been far more satisfying than what we yeah. had here. Then Agreed. Him opening the metal shed and walking out in the middle of the daylight. It's like, yeah. what are you doing? A, yeah. An experienced, professional, trained, <laughs> best sniper yeah. in the world would not do that. Yeah. So why is he doing it? This goes against all my instincts. But, I shot but it's the end of the movie, so I got to yeah, get up and go. start walking around. Time for a stroll. All right. You know, I did like the little lady's jab um, when they're walking to the boat at the end. Um, Sachi's mom. And she goes, I know this isn't appropriate to say to a commissioner or commissar or something along those lines. Right before she's like, maybe it's good that the Germans win. But she makes that one little comment. Just and maybe that was kind of one of those where. And then right after that, of course, the lady gets wounded. So maybe that was the moment where it was him starting to realize that there was no no new man. It yeah, was what, a nice yeah. little jab. What did you guys think of um, Dan Love telling her that, that her son was a traitor and defected to the Germans rather than the truth that he had been killed? I mean, in a way, like both are terrible. Yeah. Uh, Two bad options, yeah. But I guess I mean, what what does he gain from telling her the one versus the other versus the actual thing that happened? Uh, well, he his goal was to get her to leave the city, right? So that he could have her out and then get his love interest to go with her or at least, you know, yeah. help that Mom family. Mom might have wanted to stay and die if she had known. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's tied back to the ill-conceived love situation. All right. Yeah, I, mean, I guess. I mean, it's a little bit open about, to interpretation. About Metal Mouth? I don't remember his name. Oh, Ron Perlman's character. Yeah, and he had some good stuff, too. Because that's that was legit. Um, Russian soldiers getting captured, and when they would finally be returned to their units, they were treated like they were um, traitors and told that the only way you'd either go to the gulag or you go to the front line. And so a lot of them were just sent sent to die that was how they proved that they were loyal to their country yeah because his story was that he was at this sniper school in germany and then mm -hmm. the war broke out yeah. and then because he was in germany they were like well you must be a traitor he's like yeah. well wait a minute i was in germany because you sent me to germany <laughs> yeah and that happened with stuff like uh the germans would surround a russian unit the russian unit would hold out um and then finally when the russians would catch back up um they would send them off to prison and then um same thing with uh the prisoners there at stalingrad 
um, early in the war when the first happened, they caught, they captured people. And when the, the Russians finally recaptured their own people, um, they either sent them off to prison or said, you can rejoin, but you got to go to frontline units. Yeah. A lot of those prisoner group battle groups or prisoner, whatever you want to call them were, yeah, given the, the worst duties, like the most mm -hmm. dangerous suicidal jobs to do. Mm -hmm. It's not, not great. Yeah. Go run through a minefield in front of a, a unit. And then they justify mm -hmm. it by, we would have lost that men amount of men anyway, if there wasn't a minefield there. So whatever. Yeah, human life. I just couldn't imagine. Stalingrad was terrible. Far less valuable in a situation like that. And when we kind of got Aleppo, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if y'all ever watched the videos from coming out of Aleppo. Aleppo was a, a probably about as close as you could get to a modern day Stalingrad. And man, I just can't imagine living in stuff like that. Picking horse flesh off of dead dead horses, um, trying to survive. There's stories of cannibalism. Um, can't imagine. I do wish they had done a little better job of depicting how miserable the cold was. Yeah. And also the lice situation, apparently. I thought about that too, and they were fucking. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and they should have been like, they should have made it like a, a, like a love moment where he's like seductively picking the lice off of her. <laughs> Just, that would have been <laughs> digging them out of her hair. Just <laughs> yeah. so romantic. Yeah. Running so his romantic. fingers through her hair and like his yeah. fingers are just moving. Uh, God, well, yeah, I can't imagine that. But yeah, there are all kinds of stories of uh, not only the invading Germans outside Stalingrad just being covered in lice, but also, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the people living in horrific conditions inside the city too. And that you could tell whenever... Uh... A person would die because the lice would just jump off the body. Just no there's no any fresh blood to drink anymore. So yeah. you gotta yeah. bail. Yeah. Ugh. Can't imagine. But that seems to be a pretty reoccurring story. Vietnam, my uh, not my lay, uh in Diem Phu lice. World War One lice. That just yeah. sucks. You're already in a shitty situation. Now you got all that crap on you. But it would have made for a really funny moment if they were making love, picking lice <laughs> off each other. <laughs> would have been more realistic at any point. <laughs> so realistic. Yeah. yeah, maybe I could have bought the love story if, if that had happened. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, do you guys have any final notes before we get into final summary and review? We've been going almost an hour here. Oh, well, just to, of the authentic, authenticity of the uh, of Danilov, at one point he does play up the, the class struggle angle of Vasily mm -hmm. versus Harris, which I thought was pretty accurate. I mean, communists are always going on and on about class and how it's mm -hmm. a struggle of the, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat and how, yeah, the, the major represented this, you know, upper class rich guy coming in. And it's just the down out, you know, uh, yeah. underdog hero of Vasily trying to trying to beat him. Well, it helps even the, like the, uh, the Russian stuff. people really get behind him. The simple stuff, like when you first see him, he's sitting in the train and he's reading this massive book. And then when they're sitting there at the table with Jude Law's character and he can't even spell Cole, you know, yeah. like they did a really good job of playing up that class struggle of how different they were. And I don't even, I don't know. I, I almost went back to look at it because I, I half noticed it. And if they did, then it was just an overborn effort to make it m depict how much of a class struggle there was. But I feel like his bookmark was a U.S. dollar bill, you know, just to add that extra little layer of he's so fancy and world traveled, I guess. I don't know. I just wow. thought it was weird that I should have watched this in HD. I was, just, yeah. didn't notice that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how I noticed it either. It's just those one little thing. Cause I mean, I, maybe it was just the hyper realization of how they were playing up his, his prestige and grandeur. And 
And I just happened to notice it. So you're contrasting uh, Ed Harris and, and Jude Law again. And, and But you brought up that scene where uh, Vasily demonstrates that he can't spell words all that well or whatever. But that, yeah, when that, whole, that, letter. that bothered me a lot because that was where Danilov started trying to paint Vasily in a poor light in front of the girl because the girl was there. Yeah. Yeah, right on. He's playing up like, oh, look how dumb this guy is. You you wouldn't like him. Yeah. You know? It was like a total dick move. Oh, I guess yeah. I, was, I guess I wasn't paying it. I wasn't looking at it as that. I thought they're... Well, I mean, because the one of the next scenes after that is when they finally show the guy because um, he's starting to build up his legend. And so I guess maybe that was the only thing going into my brain was they're just trying to show that this is a little simpleton man who can't even spell the word coal. And then the next scene is Ed Harris reading that massive book, sitting on the train, fancy train, smoking the fancy cigarettes. And... Yeah. All right. Well, maybe it's got multiple layers because I was looking at how Danilov and Vasily's relationship changed in that moment. But then, yeah, you, then you're contrasting it in the next scene with with Ed Harris. Yeah. So, no, I can totally see what you're saying. That makes sense. Yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely mentioned, I noticed what you're talking about, Daniel. Every time that Rachel Weiss was in the room, Danilov was pointing out how stupid Vasily was, for sure. Right. And maybe she likes stupid. I mean, come on. You know, maybe <laughs> stupid can be lovable. Come on now. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, why don't we get into uh, last uh, summaries and reviews here? Uh, Robert, why don't you lead us off? We'll go to Scott. Okay. Well, uh, Enemy at the Gates, I think I saw this originally back in the day. I think I was like, like a blockbuster and or not even a blockbuster. Maybe it was like a supermarket and I think I rented it. VHS <laughs> shows how old I am. But uh, I, back in the day, I mean, it was one of those kind of forgettable war films. I, you know, I didn't have this perspective on communism that I do now. And I remember just the sniper duel bit. And I, that's definitely the focus of the film is the, the, the silly as a sniper and his life in this war. And it's set, you know, admit the backdrop, but, and I, I get that, it's a hero's journey and he's got this goal to overcome at the end by killing this other sniper. But in the beginning of the film, it really sets up that this struggle against these Nazi people attacking the city is a make or break it event. And that somehow Vasily is going to take part in the, you know, the victory. And I guess in a way he does, but it really doesn't seem like it. It's really more seems like he's just kind of trying to survive and do what he can, which is accurate to real life. But I guess if you're trying to set up a film in which the hero, you know, succeeds in his goal, if you're setting up the goal to be the defeat of the Nazis in Stalingrad, that seems like a big goal for just one sniper to do. And then if you don't even accomplish that in the film, it feels a little bit hollow at the end. So, and then, and then the ending itself is really, really weird with Ed Harris is basically giving himself up for no reason. So I don't know, man, it, it, it just seems like a bit of a mess with the, the love triangle and, all the things that I've just been talking about, the his historic inaccuracies and all that. I mean, it's a decent enough hero's journey where he's just some nobody. He gets recognized. They build him up. He gets better. And then he has his doubts about, Ooh, I don't even know if I can beat this guy. You're you sending me out as a suicide mission. He's just better than me. And then he somehow finds a way to do it, but he doesn't just find a way to do it. He just kind of lucks out that Ed Harris just decides to commit suicide or something. It was, it's completely unsatisfying ending. So I can't really recommend this film. I mean, it was a good discussion. I like the, the, the way that it, you know, kind of trashes on communism at the end there. That, that was nice. Uh, although, uh, I don't know, it, that could have been more of the focus or, uh, no, I think I'm okay with that. I'm, I think I'm okay with the way that communism was portrayed in the film, but I, I just don't think it's 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 super great. So I'm gonna give it like a, a five point five. 
All right. All right. Pretty low score for you, but typical. Typical where you see you. Well, old Robert used to give pretty low scores. Recently, you've been given really high scores. So, so we're back. Well, to there's Robert just for the new year. so much better films. There are better. If you even want to go war, there's just better stuff. I mean, it's all state propaganda, but at least this film does kind of tear down that state propaganda in a way. Although, because, you know, it kind of shows like this whole nationalistic propaganda is kind of reveal the bullshit in, in its yeah. nucleus, like being made. Right. Yeah. So I appreciate that for sure, but it's not like a better movie, you know, a better war movie. There are, there are a lot better war movies if you want to see that, just in terms of a story well told. I'll put it that way. Yeah. But for the libertarian in me, of course, I think this is one of the better, better war movies. All right. Very good. So 5.5 out of you. And Scott, your, uh, your final uh, comments and a score, please. Uh, yeah, actually, I liked your last statement that libertarian side i think would score it higher um just because it was nice to hear a movie bash socialism and communism um but you knew it had its its own reasons um it's never for what we we desire them to do it for uh yeah same thing historical accuracies other than the city being trashed um it's just a fun little sniper story but it ends horribly um the most trained sniper ever leaving his foxhole and walking around in broad daylight. It's stupid. Um, it's probably one of my lower cared for movie films. It probably beats out Dunkirk. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not wrong about that. I think that might be. But I think that might be the only movie that I can say that out loud that it beats. Um, but. Hmm. I don't know. I wasn't a fan. I wouldn't recommend it, especially at this point, because that's true. There's there's so much better. Hacksaw Ridge is a better film. I would tell everybody to go to watch that before then. I tell them to go watch this movie. Uh, if I gave it a score, um, man, like a four. Not much in the way of real action. Um. Mostly just people living underground in dirty cities, destroyed cities, taking occasional shots at each other. All right. Well, I'm a little bit surprised you guys said not so much action in this movie. I thought that there was a fair amount of war action in it. And when I was watching this with my wife, she was like, this is boring. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's people dying everywhere. They get shot. It's all this blowing up stuff. Come on. But uh, speaking of Hacksaw Ridge, we did that long ago on episode 24 of the actual anarchy podcast. So if anyone wants to hear that and our very vintage old timey radio AM sound, uh, actual anarchy.com slash 24, you can check that out. Robert and I did that for, I think Memorial day. And we were really worried that we were oh, going to yeah. have a challenge in talking about that film without like being overly offensive, but I think we pulled it off. I think we did okay on that one. But, uh, speaking of this film, uh, I actually liked it better, I think, than you guys did. Um, and it might be because of the selection bias where I was the one who recommended this film, but that was based on uh, seeing the trailer. I had not seen this film in two ta until two days ago. And I want to say that the trailer, as per usual, was better than the film. The, <laughs> the love story was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, the um, But I did like the, the showing of how they're utilizing propaganda to build up this hero persona and how he's, he's known more for his alleged exploits or his grandiosity of them being retold than his actual exploits or what he was actually accomplishing. I mean, certainly he had some skills and he was doing his best in defending his, his land, but it wasn't like he was this amazingly gifted unstoppable killing machine like the Ed Harris character was depicted as. But overall, I, th I still think it was pretty entertaining, if not a bit muddled. I was a little bit confused on, especially the little kid, like, was he helping the Germans or was he helping the Russians? It seemed like it was a little bit of a flip-flop uh, here and there. Um, but overall, I think it was a, it was a pretty good movie if you just kind of disregard the whole 
um, love story aspect of it and just focus on kind of the, the battle between the, the evil and the evil, the Nazis and the commies. So I'm going to go with a six on this one. Um, I think it's it's definitely worth checking out. And I know that our, our buddy Mike C, who's been a guest on several times, um, he thought that we would find some interesting things to talk about. It. And I think that his point was the um, calling out of communism and how there is no equality in everything. There might be equality. You can maybe force equality in some things, but not in everything. You know, so like we we're talking about how we're compensated differently, not not necessarily monetarily, but in, in other ways. People have skills that aren't just monetary or aren't just certain things. Like everyone is different. Everyone's unique and everyone has different abilities. And there's no way to create total equality of, of, among people's abilities or their circumstances or anything like that. So all of these things that try to enforce that through government edict and state violence are, um, you know, not going to work and, and they're immoral to begin with. So that's the message I get from this movie. And so for that reason, I think it is recommended and worth watching. And yeah. I'll the, the libertarian in me says, yeah, if you want a good lesson in why communism is stupid, that's a, one, this is one way you could do it. Or at least this is a movie you could show, you know, your average normie or even maybe a, a communist or a socialist. Maybe they would think it's just anti-socialist propaganda. And probably there's some of that, but I think that makes good, valid points, especially at the speech at the end. All right. Uh, any final comments from you, Scott, regarding the film? Um, and then I will mention what we're going to be doing next. No. Um, I mean, it did spark a... I'm trying to think of the film's title now. Um, about... Enemy at the Gates? No, 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 no. No, there's another one that does a really good job of bashing communism. And I was just one of those where it's, if I was, if somebody was to say, hey, what's a good film to do that? This wouldn't be the one that I would point it at. I'd point it at that one. What's um, that one communist movie we did not too long ago, Daniel? The Red, whatever? Reds? The Reds. Yeah. Are you talking about that one? No. Um, this is about Cambodia. Um, it was one of the generals for the Tamale Tigers or whatever they are. And this dude, like, it's brutal. The only way they could get him to talk about what he did was to tell him that they wanted to make a documentary out of it. Oh, yeah. We did that one, too. You know what yeah. I'm talking about? That person killed my killing. Father. The act of killing. killing. Oh, yeah. The act, the act of killing. Of killing. There it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. That was yeah. fucking horrifying. Yeah. That horrifying. documentary that is the one. horrific. Yeah. That would be the movie that I would say over this in a heartbeat. Um, to bash yeah, that communism because that, that movie was hard was to fucking watch. Wild, yeah. Seriously, watching them, even watching the man cry, like you know, Happy wants to be happy because you're like, God, good, he's suffering, but you're just like, man, like it was such an intense cry that even the part of you felt bad that this man's life had to be lived that way. It was that movie was terrible. That was a fucking terrible film. Oh, but, if you ever want to lose your faith in humanity, watch Act of Killing a couple times. Yeah. It is a nightmare film. Come God, to life. That was, yeah. Yeah. But especially with with communism, because, I mean, it was just nothing how willing they were to slaughter everybody. Oh, yeah. Um, and for the slightest infraction or even the suggestion yeah. that they were not communists or whatever, yeah. they're just like, oh, yeah, well, we're just going to go and kill these people. Mm -hmm. And the obvious power that he derived from doing it felt like a, he still feels like a gangster. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was that, one, that was movie. I, I, I'd, I'd advocate that over this film. If we were talking, if it was the libertarian me advocating films about fucked up sides of communism, then that's that's what I would do. This is, it's just I don't know. I guess it's so old now at this point. That what two thousand is when it came out. It's just so old now that it's just yeah. it's just kind of dull as far as war films go. Like I can't stand watching the the, the Volga scene because of how bad the water geysers are, you know, when the shells are exploding. <laughs> you're like, well, you're watching this in like 4K high def, you know, so you can. <laughs> no, 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 yeah, no. nothing's going to stand up to that. You're watching me in 4K. That's it. <laughs> I, we're just we're just getting my camera now. I've been watching it on my TV. Oh, very cool. Well, uh, the act of killing we did way, way long ago on episode nine of the Actual Anarchy version of the show so you can 
people can find that at actionlogic.com slash nine. Uh, and uh, next week, we're going to be bringing back a guest who was here for El Camino. It's Jared Wall of Breaking Liberty, talking about the Matthew McConaughey film Gold that he had mentioned while we were recording the previous episode of El Camino. So, uh, Robert, I haven't seen that yet, but uh, it sounds like and looks like there's a lot of good content in there. And so I'm looking forward to that next week. He was a good interview, and um, I think we might have him on again for a Valentine's Day episode, uh, which we will mention next week when we record gold with him. Sounds good. Yeah. From what I recall of that conversation, when he was talking about gold, I think it was in the KTO, how it was like McConaughey's this prospector and he has to like grease wheels and he gets a contract, but then they screw him over on the contract. It's like a whole, it sounds like a really good property rights type of discussion. And then of course, also people like him get vilified for like strip mining third world countries and that sort of thing. So it sounds like it's going to be ripe for content. Indeed, indeed. So I'm looking forward to that. And Scott, thank you for joining us for this. I hope you can stick around for a little bit of the Kathleen Turner Overdrive after this, which is available for our Patreon supporters. And people can get in on that action at lastnarrative.com slash Patreon. And uh, the show notes and everything for this will be lastnarrative.com slash 106. And uh, we will be back uh, for that after these messages. So we'll say good night from last night, everyone. All right, I got a couple uh, more minutes of the actual anarchy version of the show before we get into the Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which, uh, Robert, I, I just want to mention, we're going to be doing the movie that inspires Kathleen Turner Overdrive uh, some point very soon in the next couple of weeks. You know what film How is that, that is? Possible? How is that possible? I know. You, I, I shared with you the upcoming schedule, and it was like, whoa, there's so much stuff. But uh, we're going to fit it in here. Yeah, so that's <laughs> what, isn't it... Um... John Cusack. It is Jack Black, John Cusack. High fidelity. That's right. Yep. The total mm -hmm. beta move movie. Uh, but uh, it still has some interesting stuff. And Jack Black, of course, is amazing. And uh, he, he really breaks out the soulful singing. So I'm a big fan of that. And um, so this movie actually is going to have content, Daniel. It'll have. <laughs> and we're going to have a guy on who is a music guy. So. Even if we just talk about Echo and the Bunny Man and the Kinky Wizards, we're going to have plenty. All right. I trust you. All right. So back to <laughs> Enemy at the Gates. I actually had one more thing. So we talked about the ending being terrible with Ed Harris just like revealing himself foolishly to get shot, uh, but being a man about it and taking it like a man. But actually, there was an additional scene after that where Vasily is looking for the Rachel Weisz character. She's been injured. She's recovering in hospital. And she, he's been writing letters to her or somehow getting information about where she might be. And he shows up at one of these hospitals and is like, this is the address she had given me. This is her name. This is she should be here. And they're like, oh, she's not in our system. She's not in our records. But she's like right there, four beds down. So it was just another icing on the top. Or yeah, is that, is that how you say that? Icing on the cake? Yeah, icing, icing on the top, on the Daniel. That's that's the phrase. <laughs> yeah. I don't know phrases. Uh, but just how terribly inept the socialist communist system was in keeping track of all this stuff. I mean, she was right there, and they were like, no, she's not here. She can't be here because it's not here on this piece of paper here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well. it's no they're notoriously bad record keepers, Soviet Russia. I mean, in part and due to like state secrecy and all that. We saw that in Chernobyl the series we did, but just the famously poor record keepers in addition to, I mean, it's also like it was in a fairly archaic system and Russia is this massive place. So pile that on top of government ineptitude and state secrecy and yeah. yeah I mean, government over here is not much better. <laughs> just FYI, it's it's shit show. We're having to deal with that on a daily basis in the uh, private sector. Oh, I can't believe I'm about to defend the commies, but I think 
what happened was right as she was getting on the boat, if you recall, the woman said, she's my daughter. So maybe it was just a matter of the woman's last name was written on there. And that's why they said, we don't have anybody here by that name. Oh, all right. Yeah, that's plausible because she had the, she had the pass. She had the so pass. Under the one person. Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, that's right. Please mm -hmm. let her on the boat. She's my daughter. But otherwise, yeah. fuck the commies. Yes, they were horrible at keeping records. All right, so maybe a little bit of both. It's mm -hmm. it's plausible that there's a reason why they have that answer, but fuck them anyway. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. all right, well, yeah. that's probably enough extra content. Uh, so we will um, say good night to everyone on uh, episode 163 of the Actual Anarchy podcast. Uh, check us out at uh, Patreon at lastnighters.com slash Patreon or actualanarchy.com slash Patreon. You can get this, some of the Kathleen Turner Overdrive, which will be coming up right after this. The Chipmunks. C-H-I-P-M-U-N-K. We're the Chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do, 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 do